With Asia's emerging economies growing exponentially and China on the rise, geopolitics could be giving way to geoeconomics. The world order is changing. The Wharton School and Singapore Management University brought together about 150 business leaders and industry experts to discuss what lies ahead for Asia and global trade. The event, which was supported by the Tanoto Foundation, revealed insights into how the new world order could shape up. In painting the broad strokes of the current landscape, Professor Jeffrey Garrett, Dean of the Wharton School, introduced the concept of a rebalancing in world order. His keynote speech kicked off the half-day event. I think it would be a dramatic overstatement to say that either that the U.S. doesn't care about Asia or that the U.S. has lost Asia. But I think it is fair to say that the U.S. is losing ground in Asia, at least in relative terms. Asia is a strategic dilemma, not a crisis-driven dilemma. The Chinese leaders are, are, of course, very sophisticated. And I think they understand the nervousness that people associate with China's rise. Will that get turned into military power? Which is why I think the biggest thing that China is doing right now isn't geopolitics, it's geoeconomics. It's Belt and Road, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. For this entire region, there is a rebalance going on. It's not the rebalance that Obama envisioned, which was more US foreign policy, more American focus on Asia. It's a rebalance for every country in the region where every country in the region must decide what is our grand strategy with respect to China and the US. I think generically all countries in Asia must do two things and are doing two things. The first one is to work with China as a partner and in particular as an economic partner. And that doesn't mean you have to become a strategic ally of China. All countries should try to maximize the incredible win-win opportunities from the rise of China economically. The second thing that Asian countries should do, and I believe are doing, is to encourage the United States to remain involved and to get more involved. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome <laughs> to the Wharton SMU Dialogue. Here we are to debate the new world order. Is it a new world order? What are the implications to Asia and global trade? And let me bring you in with my distinguished guest, Professor Jeffrey Garrett, Dean of the Wharton School. <laughs> Professor Tommy Koh, Ambassador at Large of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. Mr. Helmut Sitohang, member of the Executive Board, CEO of Asia Pacific of Credit Suisse. And <laughs> Professor Jerry George, Dean of the Lee Kong Chan School of SMU. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Garrett, do you really see this as a new world order? There is a pivot not towards the United States, but actually a pivot towards China. Do you think this is a transitional phase? Can the world accommodate itself to a situation where you have two superpowers? It's not Russia and the, and the United States, but actually China and the United States. And how do you balance that? Well, at the end of the day, I'm still an optimist. The US-China economic relationship is the biggest and most complex economic relationship in the history of the world, which is why I'm not concerned about geopolitical issues as much as I am about geoeconomic. And that's where uh, I become a little more critical of the United States. I think that in relative terms, China has done geoeconomics in the last 10 years more effectively than the US has. Um, now, what does that mean for every, everyone in the world in this, in this region? I think, it, I, I think it just does mean that having, having an effective China strategy is critical to the future of every country in Asia. But that doesn't mean that the US has gone away. You know, after the financial crisis in 2008, when I was in Australia, people were writing off the US as yesterday's economic power, it's never coming back, we shouldn't think about it. The US has come back, right? The US has come back. And I think, I, I think actually there's been much less protectionism than, than your lead suggested. 
If you think about the anti-globalization sentiment that's been that's driven a lot of the populism in the Western world, it's mostly been anti-immigrant mm. rather than anti-trade. Uh, foreign investment is up in all countries of the world. Mm. So, so I I think it's a you know we want to think about uh, dichotomies, new world order, old world order. I think there's a, a lot more blending now, but the, but the big story in the blend is after the dramatic changes in China domestically in the last 30 years, I think we're now in an era where the external implications of China's rise are being felt much more viscerally by everybody, and that's why I think all countries must have an effective China strategy. Professor Tommy Ko, you believe that there is no new world order, but if the world is driven not by geopolitics, but geoeconomics, the United States is no longer the superpower of the world in terms of trade. Uh, Doesn't that at least yeah. suggest that we're sort of on a transitional um, phase? In, instead of answering your question, yes. I want your permission to quarrel with Jeffrey. Oh, please, <laughs> please. So, Jeffrey, I, I disagree with you. You said President Obama pivot to Asia, rebalancing in Asia was just empty rhetoric. I respectfully disagree. While China is ASEAN's largest trading partner, it is also true that the United States has more investment in ASEAN than China does. President Duterte may want to separate the Philippines and the United States and join China. But the rest of us in ASEAN, we have a different uh, policy. If I could speak for the 10 countries of ASEAN, our collective ambition is to be very close to all the major powers, but not to be aligned with any of them. We do not wish to become Chinese allies or US allies, Japanese allies or Indian allies. We want to be close to all the major powers, but not to be aligned with any of them. We'll pick up on some of the points yeah. in just a little yeah. bit. Uh, Professor Ko, I want to bring you into the conversation, Professor George. Don't you at least agree, based on your research, that the world is shifting towards a different paradigm? So I have to tell you, the first point I'd, is to think about that liberal collective good based on a Western sort of rules-based order is fraying at the edges. Mm. All right. So what that would mean then is not necessarily, as our discussion has uh, taken us, just US and China. I'd like to remind us that there are, the world is multipolar, right? That, that we are becoming increasingly multipolar in a way. We've forgotten the Europeans. There are some in the room. Uh, that, and that's important to consider. Uh, we've forgotten the Indians and the other uh, Japan. Uh, and because of that, uh, we are renegotiating. We are in a phase where we are rethinking or renegotiating what is the new world order, right? And that would mean a multipolar world where we rethink our dependencies, whether it's economic dependencies or political dependencies. So that rebalancing is gonna take a slightly different shape rather than just the conversation about US and China. We are entering into quite interesting phase. There's the new term called you know, synchronized growth, uh, which I think is uh, happening for for the first time in at least in the last uh, you know, 10 years. So I think there's actually a very interesting opportunity. Actually, Europe uh, growth is accelerating. Uh, but within that whole constellation, obviously, the visibility and the prominence of Asia overall is actually increasing. Right? Mm. And it's not because the others are diminishing, but Asia as, uh, as a overall, as a block, is actually growing faster. My basic point is that we, are, we do not have a new world order. The, the world order under which we live is the same world order constructed post-Second World War. It is an order based on three principles. Democracy, market economy, and free trade. Ironically, the country that's challenging this world order is not China. It's the United States. Mm. We have an administration in Washington today that's against free trade, against globalization, and against open economies. But Professor so, Koh, <laughs> what, if, what if the US ends up revisiting history by sparking trade sanctions, by sparking a global trade war. There is evidence of that in 1930. Yeah. And then what happened? It fought, it battled with the, with the Europeans, and then it deepened the Great Depression. Then w wouldn't, wouldn't the economic battle lines actually translate into a different world order? Uh, I think we live in a very dangerous moment in world history. Um, there is a prospect of a global trade war. And memories are short. People choose not to learn the lessons of history. 
but I would appeal to Americans to remember that in the 1930s, the United States flirted with protectionism. It passed the notorious Smoot Hawley Act, and it helped to precipitate the Great Depression. Mm. So my, my question to my American friends here and viewers of this program is, do you want to go down that road again? We'll keep on sparring until we conclude whether this is a transition, transitional phase or a new order. Yeah, Professor Ko, thank you. We've got to go for a quick break. And still to come, <laughs> what is the grand strategy for Asia and ASEAN? Stay tuned. Hello there, welcome back. Here we are talking about whether we actually have a new world order. We sparred about whether the world is in a new state of affairs in light of the fact that maybe things are not dominated, dictated by geopolitics anymore. Maybe it's all about geoeconomics. Uh, Professor George, your view of the world is that it's going to be more driven by geoeconomics and three critical things are key human capital, natural resources, and data. At what point, what stage are we? So I agree with Jeff that innovation would be a key driver in, in, in rebalancing this uh, new world order. But though that innovation has to come in three parts. One, when we talk about data, we talk about data as an opportunity. So rebalancing would happen where we look at data itself as a resource. The second one is thinking of natural resources as physical resources in terms of consumption, as well as the ability to manage our lifestyles of production and, and consumption. So from that perspective, the ability to control natural resources in regions as well as across the world, uh, that creates, uh, we need some innovations in that space. And the third piece, innovation is done by people. And flows of people from one part of the world to the other, which we call immigration, is a critical piece in that. So if, if we believe that innovation and creativity and breaking off new ideas and disruptive models comes from bringing very disparate ideas together and different uh, experiences together, then we have to have a much more open model. Just on that basis, I think the US still holds the lead and will continue to hold the lead. When we talk about innovation, you see the phenomenal growth of Chinese tech giants. They're really rewriting the game. Does that give you conviction that, in fact, there will be a bipolar world and businesses need to accommodate to that situation? I think the it's. I don't think uh, it's about bipolar, but I think it's. I think uh, you mentioned earlier it's about multipolar. Right? I, mm. I agree with that. I think. Uh, in the current world, uh, there's actually so much opportunities, and I think the growth that's been created, uh, you know, across the world in Asia Pacific has, just, has uh, created a lot of uh, opportunities. And I think Asia, given it's driven, the economies are driven a lot of by the first and second generation entrepreneurs. I think, in particular, has this very interesting. Uh, and unique position in the world economy given the drive of the entrepreneurs. Professor uh, Ko, is it possible that even though geopolitics will continue to prevail and dictate the way countries behave, is it also possible to pick up on Professor George's point that actually there could be a new par uh, paradigm on the horizon, one that is driven by human capital, natural resources and data? Um, I, I agree that the world is being changed in a very fundamental way by technology. I think that the world in the 21st century will be fundamentally different from the way the, way the world was in the last century. Oh, there's this is a being, new world order. <laughs> I would put it differently. I would say <laughs> politically, we are beginning to see the emergence of a world with the following polls. The United States still is the biggest and most important poll, followed by China, followed by India, Japan, Russia and the European Union. So you have six poles in, in terms of political power. But economically, we are being transformed in front of our eyes by digital economy, by artificial intelligence, by um, 3D printing, by, you know, all these dis disruptive technologies. And I think we're still trying to figure out how can we harness the opportunities and minimize the disruption that will occur in each of our economy. Do you agree, P Professor? Well, Mayer? I think I mean the, that 
that point I think is incontrovertible that uh, actually I'll add to it. It's just combination of technology plus globalization, clearly the two biggest drivers changing the world. I think that's been true for the last 30 years. Probably the baton has moved from globalization, which I really think, I mean, the biggest, the, the biggest rate of change in globalization was in the 1990s, actually, not today. Technology probably in the last 15 years has been more important. You know, the, the challenge with both of those things is that um, the people who've won have won big, but the, the number of people who've been excluded has increased. And so that, you know, that, that's an enormous challenge in, in all of our countries. I think one of the reasons we see anti-globalization more than anti-technology is, and, and in fact, not anti-globalization, but anti-immigrant, you can see it, mm. whereas it's harder to be opposed to technology, even if we think the, the consequences are gonna be bigger. So, so, you know, your new world order, maybe you were envisaging a geopolitical new world order, but I think on, we, we've now got a multi-dimensionality to that because I think Jerry's perspective is not one of geoeconomics. Mm. We've got a third dimension now where, where technological change is, is really the big story. And, and you know, I, I think for us all that, that means um, charting, of course, the future is not easy because you've got to keep all these things in your mind all at once. You've got India, China, and Indonesia in that order. If really the battle lines are drawn about who gets the natural resources, who has human capital, and who has data, then these three countries will be the leaders of the future? No, no I, I think you've uh, interpreted that comment uh, differently. Uh, the way I would say natural resources, thankfully for us, is spread all over the world, right? And, but the access to natural resources uh, differs by country, right? Uh, the, the big fights on natural resources are in the Antarctic, for example, or in, in spaces, uh, in areas outside. Um, but also when you look at rare earths as an issue, um, seven, eight years ago, there were changes in policies, for example, in China, that looked at rare earth metals and said, oh, we are not going to export rare earth, rare earth metals because it was important for uh, production systems. That changed the equilibrium when all countries then re-looked at their dependency on natural resources and said, hey, we can't rely on one single country because they are able to process that rare earth or metal. So countries are now rethinking that. Apart from natural resources, one big thing we left out when we talk about technology, the ability to reshape the world order is also from climate change. Mm. We forget that climate change over the next 30 years is going to create a migration pattern vastly different from the migration pattern caused by intellectual capital. So how do we rebalance or intellectual capital or physical wars? Now, how do we rebalance populations uh, that, and the flows of people to different parts of the world because of climate change will create a disruption that we've not seen ever before, right? Or maybe we've seen it in the great wars, but it would be that magnitude that we will then see it again in the next 30 years. We'll talk more about that, the implications of disruption on business, plus what are the opportunities and potential ahead? Stay tuned. Hello, welcome back to Wharton SMU Dialogue. So let's pick up on that conversation. When you look at an economy like Indonesia, for example, it's just coming up. You have a youthful and dynamic population. So as an investment banker, when you go see that kind of potential, does that give you hope since it's supposed to be a multipolarized center? I think obviously, you know, opportunities exist uh, everywhere in Asia. Obviously, Indonesia with, you know, 250 million, uh, you know, population, uh, very strategically ge um, geographically located, uh, you know, the dynamics and the, and the population and so on, I think uh, provides very interesting opportunity. One thing which I want to highlight as well, which we probably haven't talked as much, which I heard a lot of from my clients across the region in, in the whole Asia Pacific is, I think one of the challenges is actually also in the human capital. Mm. And what I mean by that is not on the lower kind of uh, skilled labor, uh, but more on the management and especially on the upper management. The rise is much faster. So if there's one, uh, challenge which I'd like to, uh, for the region, which I think I'd like to highlight. I think that's one thing which in particular is, is uh, important and partly it can be addressed by, again, uh, policies which is more open to immigration, to transfer of, uh, 
of uh, what you got of uh, human capital and not by being protectionist or trying to limit uh, the movement of human capital. So the portions of economies like Indonesia and many um, other members of ASEAN, uh, as you highlighted before, will hinge greatly on what happens to Belt and Road. Is that going to be the game changer, Professor Garrett? Well, it's a, I mean, look, it's a complicated world. I just think that it's clear that for most emerging markets, infrastructure is one of the biggest opportunities. So of course you must take Belt and Road very seriously. So that's not true for Singapore, it's not true for Korea, it's not true for Japan, it's not true for Australia in relative terms, maybe Australia the most. But there are estimates that the infrastructure needs in emerging Asia are like 20 trillion, 25 trillion. So if that's true, yes, that one trillion on concessional terms from China, and it can happen right now, is important, but it's not gonna be the totality. Um, it, you know, it, it, the way we would hope that this to work, I think, is that if you start with, you start with something that's a little more government-led, in the end, that'll create more certainty, uh, which will lead to more private sector investment. So, so I think this is going to be a very big story, but I don't think you can discount the importance of Belt and Road because of the past history, the past history in which the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank promised to do this kind of stuff and it didn't happen. Mm. And it didn't lead, I don't think, to the private sector investment. So let's hope this time is different, but it's gonna be different in a, in a, in a new way, which is gonna be China-led through Belt and Road. Um, I, I think we should put Belt and Road in perspective. Um, President Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping is a visionary leader of China. And during his leadership, he has launched two very important initiatives. The first one is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which has taken off and is successful. His second initiative is a really mega multi-year project, Belt and Road. Unlike AIIB, it's much harder for China to control the success of Belt and Road. Why? Because it involves the cooperation of at least 60 other countries. And China needs to earn their trust in order for them to cooperate with China. At the moment, there is a deficit of trust between China and some important countries in the region. Um, I'll mention India as an example. Mm. Because of the deficit of trust between China and India, the Indian government chose not to attend the Belt and Road Initiative in New Delhi. There's also a deficit of trust between China and Japan, between China and Vietnam, you know. So, realizing this grand vision of, of reconnecting the ancient Silk Road on land, build, rebuilding the old maritime Silk Road will take many years and it will require the cooperation of many countries. So, unless China is able to win their trust, to show them that this is a win-win, it is not just to benefit China, it will not happen. And I wouldn't put everything into the Belt and Road um, basket, you know. For ASEAN country, Belt and Road is important, but it's not the only thing. Agreed. Much more important is for each of us to figure out how are we going to upgrade our economy? How are we, how are we going to seize the opportunities of the new world, the digital economy, and not be left behind? But, uh... Isn't it a fair assessment to say at least there will be more of a tilt towards the Chinese because the TPP might have broken down, but you've got RCEP. China is part of that. Japan is a very important player, you know. Japan is a very significant investor in the region. And with the dynamic Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, um, he, he wants to compete with China for influence in every part of Asia. Mm. Um, don't forget India. India is a, is a major player. India, in fact, has now overtaken China as the fastest growing large economy of the world. Mm. You know? And if this continues, India will be a very important player for us in the region. So from a d diplomatic per per uh, per perspective, it's actually a good thing that uh, Japan acts as a counterbalance, is that it? Um, it is a very good thing because the last thing we want in ASEAN is to live in the shadow of only one great power. Mm. Small countries benefit from uh, autonomy, room for maneuver. A when, when we have a and how do you view it <laughs> yeah, from exactly, your perspective? Exactly. So we're heading towards this world in which you have the United States, China, Japan, India, the European Union, and Russia. And don't forget, the European Union is a very important player in our region. 
it is the biggest investor in, in, in Singapore and ASEAN, you know? And nobody talks about Europe. Don't, don't count out the Europeans. So where do you see India's role in this uh, topsy-turvy uh, development? Uh, I think India, uh, the, 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 there is a nice point about India that India is large enough for it to manage itself, right, and provide opportunities for itself. Now, India has to rethink how it thinks of its world stage uh, influence in an economic way where Indian businesses have to start looking outwards rather than just inwards. Now, in terms of attention, predominantly, it is still significantly inwards. Um, there are some examples of conglomerates like the Tata Group and so forth that have gone out, but predominantly it's still internal. This discussion will continue with us for the next 20 years. But in 20 years, I think there is a lot more that India will do in stepping up. Um, uh, with the current Prime Minister uh, Modi, he's, he's taken some initiatives that have uh, significantly lengthened sort of a foresight in terms of strategy for the country itself. Um, things like uh, GST, uh, easing up uh, mobility of goods and services, uh, opening up sectors, and these, I think, over time, will play off very positively for India and Indian business when they are um, thinking of taking positions uh, in the global stage. So from a dealmaker perspective, Mr. Sitohang, it's actually a good <laughs> thing that a lot of economies are moving up the value chain. Uh, do you see more value, more value creation coming from IPOs from the Asia-Pacific region? Do you see more company uh, M&As? Do you see companies going private, which actually involves more business advisory services? So this is good news for an investment bank, right? Well, I think it's good news for all of us, right? You know, mm -hmm. we are we are just a small part of the of the whole ecosystem, right? Uh, and what we see, uh, I mean, one some of the interesting statistics, for example, Asia uh, now has the largest number of uh, billionaires and ultra high net worth uh, individuals globally. Uh, that just happened in the last few years, right? Mm -hmm. You know that the wealth creation that has happened in the region and kind of the simple rule of thumb: if uh, GDP grows five six percent, then you know, the, the wealth uh, creation, especially on the ultra high um, and the entrepreneur's level is, you know, more than double that. And I think that provides a very, uh, very uh, powerful uh, combination of wealth creation of the opportunities in the region. And for us, again, uh, and, and other banks, obviously, as well, I think the opportunities are, are great. Great insights. Yeah. And we are heading off for a short break. When we come back, so we're, uh, how do we summarize the developments that are going on? Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Wharton SMU Dialogue. Let's pick up on this theme. So we seem to be heading towards a different paradigm. We could be in a world with different multiple centers and power of, gra and power of gravity is no longer about one single unity. What happens to ASEAN? It's supposed to be based on unity, but can they stay together? I think so. We celebrated ASEAN 50th anniversary uh, last year. ASEAN has been a great success. It kept the peace in Southeast Asia for 50 years. Together, the ASEAN economy is today the seventh largest economy in the world. And the projections are that by 2030, we could be the fourth largest economy in the world. The third achievement of ASEAN is that we have been able to be the convener and you know, neutral facilitator of, of the regional institution. We bring everybody together, sit around the table, to, to, we encourage cooperation rather than conflict. I think those are... Therefore, the world becomes more relevant. Yeah. Is that right? And we have become more relevant to the world. There's no regional grouping that is able to, to entice every year the leaders of the world to come to Southeast Asia and meet with our 10 leaders. Only ASEAN has been able to do that. That's an important achievement. So, Mr. Sitoff, 
as the ASEAN economies grow, what will some of the new tech disruptions mean for the business of banking, the business cycle in general? We're talking about AI, cryptocurrencies, blockchain. What will that really mean? What happens to banks? The disruption is multiple part, right? You know, so they have the, it's actually aiding. Uh, at the same time, you know, you have companies like Alipay, for example, today, right? You know, which, you know, five, seven years ago was not in the payment system. It's now, you know, one of the largest uh, uh, process, payment processors in, in the region, right? And, the, and, and financial and so on. So I think uh, really for the banks, uh, I actually do believe that they will exist. And in our uh, case, in Credit Suisse case in particular, we are focusing us more on the value added advisory. What we use technology is to really uh, process the algorithms, the artificial intelligence. We, we have robots as well now to help us to make some of the data analytics. So when we talk to our clients at the end of the day, you know, you still need to have a human interface uh, in, mm. in our sector. But there are other banks and there are other platforms that have uh, much more different, and I think they have to also evolve to make sure that they continue to be the relevant. Let me just add to that. The technology is a disruption. Uh, there are new business models that are actually figuring out how, how we can make that work. Uh, but one of the things, one of the topics from Jeff's earlier point is this, the distributive consequences. What happens? Technology doesn't lift all boats at the same time. Therefore, it's creating a divide, and some countries are ahead and others behind. So countries have to make a conscious effort to make sure that they are bridging that gap. At the same time, businesses ha have now embraced uh, sort of this, uh, have moved from this idea of pure capitalism to a more of a sustainable capitalism model, mm. right? This, this idea that we have to have social inclusion so that uh, the benefits of uh, 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 business profitability and growth also accrue to everybody else. Uh, we are working with uh, Citi and MasterCard for looking at financial inclusion models in Southeast Asia and how do we make sure using technology that we are able to access, everybody is able to access the benefits of credit, uh, benefits of banking and so forth. And that actually is an example where technology can improve uh, the base of the pyramid. And, and in doing so, we have to make sure that new, uh, companies are embracing it and governments are then providing an, uh, an ideal sandbox for them to experiment and come up with new models that allow them to do it. That's where innovation comes through. The disruptive effects of blockchain could be profound. There is a big question about whether they break the system or whether the big financial institutions become the owners in essence of blockchain. I'm, I'm thinking a little more the latter than the former, mm -hmm. um, even if it started externally. Uh, cryptocurrencies have um, a plus and a minus, I think. Um, the plus is they're disconnected from national governments, which have incentives to do things with currency. The minus is they're disconnected from countries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the great news with exchange rates is flexible exchange rates, smooth cycles. Um, cushion business cycles and the like, so that's a positive thing. But we have seen a uh, history of um, uh, history that governments have, uh, have, in some sense, abused the authority of being the monetary authority. So it's a complicated, but I think blockchain, even if Bitcoin's not here to stay, blockchain is here to, to stay. But I do think um, in the past several years, it has been very clear that, uh, as I said, I, I think in my remarks at the podium, that the thing that's distinctive about China is nothing gets in the way of the big strategy. So if you have two, three, four priorities, nothing will stop the country from focusing on them. Um, and so I, you know, so I think that, that this tension has been there with us for a long time. I think it'll continue, but, but certainly what, you know, what, I think we're living we're living in a moment in which the in which the the economic codependence between China and the U.S. that I think we've all lived with for the last 20 years is looking a little more there's it's looking like there's less codependence and a little more friction, and you know I, I just hope that cooler heads will prevail and that, that and that things won't go get out of control and 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 why would I think the cooler heads will prevail because they have. They mm. have for a very long time. Changes in government in China and the US, radical swings in politics, central tendency of the relationship has remained the same, I think, since uh, Henry Kissinger first visited uh, China in 1971. So in 50 years from now, what will the world look like? Uh, I'm not quite a fortune teller, okay. but I can 
there are some trends, mega trends, that are going to stay for some time. The competition for natural resources will continue mm -hmm. because we're not making more of those as we did before. Um, the fight for human talent uh, and the mobility for talent will define how successful countries are. Uh, and the, the ability to reach through with data, because data, unless, unlike physical resources, is not constrained to one space. It pervades everything we do. And many countries and businesses, as part of that, will fight to control uh, elements of how we look at and create value from data. And these three trends, along with uh, uh, which climate change, which is not an issue people usually talk about, I think if you look at the next 100 years, next 50 years, climate change would be one of those topics that we're not talk talking about enough today that will change the world. Right? And these mega trends are not going to go away. What about a new world order? I'm going to stick with my original point. I think we're going to be multipolar, and because of that, we have to renegotiate our dependencies. And that's why I think ASEAN's model of innovation and resilience makes a lot of sense for us. Right? How do we, in this part of the world, think of everything that is changing around us, maintain some element of cogency in our economic activity, our cultural and our social life, uh, but at the same time are able to adapt with changes in technology, our dependence on resources, uh, and uh, the, the changes in the market itself. I think it's, uh, we, uh, and I personally also, we're actually very positive, I think, on the, on the, on the world economy and uh, Asia Pacific in particular. Uh, I think Asia has this unique uh, uh, situation where it's driven by a very strong entrepreneurship spirit. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that uh, that it's obviously the growth is inclusive. I think you know some of the disruption on or this balance that it could be created by uh, disproportionate growth in different parts of the geographies or the class segment within the society. I think it's very important to make sure that we continue to be very, very fully aware of the importance of making sure that it's uh, it's uh, it's well balanced. Uh, but I think uh, you know given the technological advances, given the wealth creation and given a lot of the infrastructure need which Professor Garrett mentioned earlier, I do think there is still a lot of potential for growth and for many years to come. And, you know, I don't know whether I can predict as far as 50 years, but I'm very convinced that at least for the foreseeable future, there's a lot of opportunities in the region. Asia is in such a different place compared to 20 years ago when it was caught up in the throes of the Asian financial crisis. Today, you have so much growth, as I highlighted earlier, three of the fastest growing G20 economies, India, China, Indonesia, AEC, 50 years from now. Do you think having ridden the wave of the Belt and Road, it's going to be a very different, prosperous place? Nobody knows. <laughs> if you look back 50 years at what has transpired in the past 50 years, no one could have predicted the development that took place the last 50 years. In the same way, we cannot predict what will happen 50 years from hence. So let me um, hedge my bets by sharing with you two scenarios the optimistic scenario and the pessimistic scenario. So let me begin with the pessimistic scenario. The, in a pessimistic scenario, we will have a new Cold War, mm. a, cold, a new Cold War with two superpowers in contention against each other, the United States on the one hand and China on the other. And it will not be a good world. It will be a fractious world. The optimistic scenario is that it is a peaceful world, a, an open world, borderless world. And in this optimistic scenario, three of the largest economies in the world are here in the region. Mm. China, India, and Indonesia. And, and the center of gravity of the world economy will be here, you know, and with all the consequences that flow from that. By that time, it'll be the new world order, <laughs> right? <laughs> 50 years is a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. So let me mention some trends. I mean, a, a bunch of what's been said, obviously, is really important. But let me mention some things that haven't been mentioned. People are going to live much longer. Women are going to be much more powerful. Machines are going to do much more. And uh, in terms of the economy, if we go 50 years out, Africa is going to be a dominant mm. part of the world economy because that's what the demography is telling us. Fascinating discussions. Thank you so much, our wonderful panelists. And if you'd like to open the floor. 
there has been a very mixed uh, reaction from, from the banks towards cryptocurrencies per se. And it's a very um, uh, popular statement I hear from everyone, just like uh, Dean Garrett just mentioned, that uh, blockchain is here to stay even though cryptocurrencies might not. I want to know um, what banks are doing about it, what kind of risks are they posing? Uh, I think there are certain parts of the function of the banks that will have to continue to be exist. Uh, you know, in our case, for example, right, you know, we were very clear that focusing on the advisory part and the value added part of the chain, it does create uh, a very unique uh, business opportunity for us, where, which is here to stay. You know, humans will still want to have advice. If I do an M&A, um, in a merger acquisition discussion with my client, I cannot say I can send you my robot or you talk to my program <laughs> computer. You know, he would like to see my face to face. Now, obviously, when I have that discussion, I will probably be much more equipped with a lot of the, uh, you know, technology uh, opportunities that exist today to bring into that discussion. But at the end of the day, you still need to have that human uh, discussion. My question relates to the risk of climate as understood by uh, the business world, as well as uh, political leaders. So I was delighted to hear Helman raise this just now. Um, and Dean George followed commenting that this would be a major issue in the next 50 to 100 years. So what does it take for leaders in each field to set aside time to better understand how the risks of climate impact their businesses? in their lives? Sustainability as a theme has, is now preoccupying uh, top leaders everywhere in this world. But if you look at sustainability, now it's become mainstream business itself. So um, if you look at agricultural commodities, the biggest issue in agriculture nowadays is not just the land or the water, but it's the honeybees. Uh, maintaining the honeybees has become one of the biggest bottlenecks for agricultural producers. So businesses now have shifted sustainability as a theme from just about corporate social responsibility to being their core business. This growth of green finance, uh, climate investment, impact investing, all of these have become significantly bigger. And Singapore as a hub has tried, is trying to build that competence and capability to be uh, a supplier of capital that is related and supportive of uh, sustainability initiatives. Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, uh, you know, when I deal with my clients, uh, with the entrepreneurs uh, um, and the senior uh, managers in the region, the focus on the impact, investing, sustainability, and so on, uh, I think it's much larger, and I think it's getting very broad-based support across, you know, whether it's the finance industry, whether it's the, just the general uh, business circles. Um, and I see that uh, quite broad-based, so I'm quite optimistic on that. I'm uh, going to be neutral, as it can be, and I'm going to point the question at uh, Tommy and um, uh, Jeffrey. Now, are some of these countries with the economic support that China delivers in the Belt and Road Initiative, the AIIB and others, yes. will some of these countries sacrifice economic prosperity for, say, security for other nature somebody mentioned? Geopolitical considerations are affecting their geoeconomic decisions. So, um, you know, the, the, the Pakistan's embrace for Belt and Road, for example, uh, stands in contrast to the Indian position on Belt and Road. Um, yeah. As I said, the Indian decision to take Japanese high-speed rail, more expensive Japanese high-speed rail over, over Chinese uh, high-speed rail, partly about quality, but partly about geopolitics, yeah. I think. Um, but if you, again, for me, it's just about what is the, what's the tilt? And the tilt right now is more China. That doesn't mean all China. It just means more China. And I think that's, a, that's just a reality that you know, we're all living with. And I think it's a reality in this region, arguably more than anywhere else. Um, I would say that um, this dilemma that you referred to is felt most acutely by American allies such as Australia and South Korea. Mm. Both Australia and South Korea depend for their economic prosperity on China. But they depend on the United States for their security. So can they continue to balance these two 
and walk this tightrope? Would they at some point be forced to choose? That's a dilemma. We talked about a lot of critical issues today. How many countries are really pivoting towards the United States? It's actually the, the, the other way, right? Pivoting towards China. In these times of great change, I think most of us agree that we might be heading towards something different if you take a long-term view. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank my wonderful panelists for <laughs> teaching us, guiding us through this session. I'm Chloe Cho, and thank you so much. Thank you so much.